So um, I talked about now last week, you know, the rootedness of seeing everything in a universal kind of way. It actually goes back to Genesis. When God looked at everything God had made and saw that it was very good, we recognized that we can find the fingerprints of God in all of creation. So there's nowhere in the universe that we can go that we don't see uh, the creative action and power of God. In fact, uh, if God did not sustain all that is in reality at every moment, it would cease to be. That includes us. So sometimes people think creation was something God did uh, billions of years ago and then left the world to be on its own. That's sort of a non-Christian deistic perspective. But we Christians believe that not only does God create from the very beginning, but the creative power of God is sustaining all that exists in every moment of being. So God is holding creation into being at every moment, although God is other than creation. So uh, I also mentioned last week that we are open to working with all men and women of goodwill throughout the whole world to protect human rights and dignity, every human life matters. Uh, all of creation, the care of God's good creation, is an essential part of why we're here on Earth. It's interesting, um, I heard a critique of Pope Francis just this past week, and the person said he needs to stop talking about taking care of creation and things like that and focus on saving souls. Uh, the fallacy in that whole approach is the way that we save our soul is by doing God's will, and part of God's will is that we take care of the creation God has given us. So they're integrated together. They're not like you can separate out care for creation, care for human persons and their dignity and rights, and saving our soul. You can't do one without the other. So they're integrated together. Um, with all people who believe in God, we share a belief in the sacred divine or, or God. Uh, at the Second Vatican Council back in the 1960s, the Declaration on Non-Christian Religions made a very key observation. We reject nothing that is good, holy, or true in any religion in the world. So uh, we believe that, in fact, all of the great religions of the planet have some elements of goodness, of beauty, and truth. And it's a matter of identifying and recognizing those. And, um, and we do believe, and we'll come to that momentarily with a document from the Second Vatican Council, we do believe that God even offers salvation to those who are not explicitly Christian yet, or have not yet even arrived at an explicit belief in God. Uh, but we certainly do share with our Jewish brothers and sisters a very deep 4,000 year tradition, and in a most particular way we're bound together with other Christians who believe in the name of Jesus, and with them we share the New Testament uh, and the ancient creeds of the Church. And most of the mainline Christians. So that's just a quick thumbnail review of what I uh, talked about last week. What I wanted to do next is to give you a taste of one of the documents from the Second Vatican Council. Uh, you all may know that the Second Vatican Council was called into being by Pope John the Twenty-Third, now a saint, Saint John the Twenty-Third. He was elected Pope in 1958. Uh, how many of y'all were alive in 1958 when Pope John was elected? Okay, some of you, yeah. So I was born during uh, the pontificate of John the Twenty-Third. Uh, I was born in 62. Uh, he didn't live long after that, actually. But uh, he was not Pope very long at all, and he made a surprise announcement that he was going to call together what we call an ecumenical council. It's a worldwide council of the Catholic Church. Uh, we've only had 21 of them in the whole history of the Catholic Church. And the first one was held in the early 300s in, in the city of Nicaea. And in those days, the great controversy was, uh, is Jesus uh, the same as God the Father in terms of his divinity, or is he just simply greater than us but not yet fully like God the Father? And uh, until that point in church history, the bishops in their own areas had been able to pretty much defend and explain the faith in a satisfactory way. But something happened in the early 300s, actually two important things. One was, uh, for the first time in the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman Emperor made it 
uh, legal to be Christian. So Emperor Constantine uh, uh, passed the Edict of Toleration so that you could be Christian legally in the Roman Empire. That was a major innovation, and it's going to be extremely significant for the First Ecumenical Council. I'll tell you in a moment why. But the other thing that happened was there was a priest in, uh, in Egypt, in Alexandria, by the name of Arius, who was teaching that Jesus, though divine, was not at the same level as God the Father, not that high up. And he even quoted the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. So he used the New Testament to uh, support his teaching and belief. His own bishop in Alexandria uh, condemned that position and said Jesus and the Father were essentially one in their divinity. Unfortunately, the bishop in Jerusalem at the time sided with the priest, Arius. So you had bishops then who were divided. So uh, when the Emperor Constantine realized that this uh, major debate was going on, it was not the kind of thing, we may think today is sort of a scholarly sort of discussion in a university or a church setting, but it became a very great source of contention in the Roman Empire to the point that when people would go to the bakery and the butcher shop and so forth, they would be discussing this in line. Sort of like several years ago when the Passion of the Christ came out and I was at the subway and I heard people arguing about whether they were going to go see it or not. You know, so public discussion. And basically the Emperor Constantine said, you know, we've got to resolve this for the sake of the unity of the empire. So he summoned all the bishops of the church to Nicaea. They met together in a worldwide council and they hammered out a solution to the problem. So that was the first one. Uh, the second Vatican Council held in the 1960s is the last one that we've had. Begun in 19, October 1962, and it was concluded on September 8, 1965. So if you do your math real quick, this coming December the 8th is the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second Vatican Council and Pope Francis has proclaimed it as the day of the beginning year of mercy. So it's a very significant year that we are in. So the Council itself produced 16 documents, four of which are central major constitutions. One of the four, the dogmatic constitution of the Church, in some ways is kind of the foundation of all the others. I'm going to share with you all a little piece of that tonight. In fact, some of you have copies of it a one little tiny section of it at your table. <laughs> Most of you more than I do can help me at this moment with technology. I'm going to close this word document over another. Do that. So if, uh, hopefully we're in the right place, um, 366, 367 on your sheets. This is a beautiful section of the document on the church, and uh, it expresses this fundamental openness that I've been talking about. If you look about halfway down the page on 366 at number 15, that's paragraph 15, one wonderful thing about every church document, by the way, is they always break them up into paragraphs that are all numbered. So you can always say, go to the document, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, and go to paragraph 15, and you can always find the location in the document that way. And you can also find, by the way, all these documents at the Vatican website, so that's always traceable uh, when you're looking for these, and we probably have copies of the Vatican II documents in our church library. So um, in number 15, it says the Church, and it's referring to the Catholic Church here, knows that she is joined in many ways to the baptized who are honored by the name of Christian, but do not, however, profess the Catholic faith in its entirety. So it's recognizing we share our communion with other Christians, though we have something we believe more, and they have not preserved communion under the successor of Peter. So the successor of Peter, we believe, is the Bishop of Rome or the Pope. 
And it goes on to say, there are many who hold sacred scripture and honor as a rule of faith and life who have sincere religious seal, who lovingly believe in God the Father Almighty and Christ the Son of God and the Savior, who are sealed by baptism, which unites them to Christ, and who indeed recognize and receive other sacraments in their own churches or ecclesiastical communities. So when we use the term in official Catholic Church documents, other churches with a capital C, it's principally referring to the Orthodox churches of the East, ecclesiastical communities typically referring to Protestant churches and the Anglican communion. Many of them possess the Episcopate, in other words, they have bishops, they celebrate the Eucharist and cultivate devotion to the Virgin Mother of God, and there is furthermore a sharing in prayer and spiritual benefits. These Christians are indeed in some real way joined to us in the Holy Spirit. For by his gifts and graces, his sanctifying power is also active in them. And he has strengthened some of them even to the point of shedding their blood. Uh, so that's one of the things I liked about Winston's talk tonight about your grandparents and parents. Yes, joined to Christ by baptism. So the Spirit stirs up desires and actions of all of Christ's disciples in order that all may be peaceably united in as Christ ordained in one flock under one shepherd. In some ways, um, the fact that there, and I'll talk a bit more about that when I get to the history, the fact that there are so many Christian denominations and churches in the world that don't get along with each other is a scandal. That's not the way Christ intended it to be. And uh, I remember um, coming home from college once and my Italian grandmother uh, said, before you know it, we're all going to be in one church. And she said, with kind of disgust. And I said, well, Grandma, didn't Jesus pray that all might be one, even as he and the Father are one? And uh, she didn't quite know what to make of that. But my grandmother would be very passionate. But here it's clear, Mother Church never ceases to pray, hope, and work that this unity may be achieved. And she exhorts her children to purification and renewal so that the sign of Christ may shine forth more brightly over the face of the church. So it's interesting you know, at, the count, at the council, the council fathers were saying, we, as Christ will, we pray that we will be one fully someday. And the way we go about that process is by our own renewal and purification. Those of us who are already Catholic, as it were, that's the way we will achieve, help to achieve greater unity through the Holy Spirit. Then at number 16, uh, finally, those who have not yet received the gospel are related to the people of God in various ways. There is, first, that people to which the covenants and promises were made, for which Christ was born according to the flesh. In view of the divine choice, they are a people most dear for the sake of the fathers, for the gifts of God, quoting St. Paul, are without repentance. So once God offers those gifts and calls them to be his people, what is that little section referring to? Our Jewish brothers and sisters, a people most sacred to God, uh, set apart. If you want to reflect a bit on how Paul struggled with the fact that many non-Jews believed in Jesus, while many of his own people who were Jewish didn't, the letter to the Romans, Paul has this really profound reflection on that great mystery of the struggle, and Paul's hope that someday uh, all would be brought fullness in Christ. But then it goes on to say the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place among whom are the Muslims. These profess and hold the faith of Abraham. Together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge on the last day. Nor is God remote from those who in shadows and images seek the unknown God, since God gives to all life and breath and all things. And since the Savior wills all to be saved, and this is a key section of this document. Those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, but nevertheless seek God with a sincere heart and moved by grace try their actions to do his will as they know it through the dictates of their conscience, those to them may achieve eternal salvation. So for those uh, who have not yet arrived at an explicit belief in Jesus, through no fault of their own, uh, they too may be saved, and somehow the grace of God is working in that. 
providing they follow the sincere dictates of their conscience. And then it goes on to say, and we'll nor shall divine providence deny the assistance necessary for salvation to those who without any fault of theirs have not yet arrived at an explicit knowledge of God and who not without grace strive to lead a good life. Whatever good or truth is found among them is considered by the church to be a preparation for the gospel and given by the one who enlightens all that they may at length have life. So it's interesting, the comparison I would use is this. We couldn't live right now if we didn't have oxygen to breathe. Sometimes we know that's the fact, and some people don't know that's the fact. They haven't studied science. They know if you stop breathing, you're not going to live, but they know they don't necessarily know it's the oxygen in the air that sustains human life until they've studied it. Uh, the grace of God moves through people who have not yet become aware explicitly of belief in God. The grace of God is still working, even though they may not yet know it. So the caveat I would say is, do we believe that all people are saved or potentially could be saved through Jesus Christ? And the answer is yes, but some people may not explicitly know that yet. That's the difference in terms of the source of that salvation. Uh, the document goes on to say that very often deceived by the evil one, men have become vain in their reasonings, have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and serve the world rather than the creator or else living and dying in this world without God, they are exposed to ultimate despair. Hence, to procure the glory of God and the salvation of all of these, the church, mindful of the Lord's command, preach the gospel to every creature, takes a zealous care to foster the missions. So we do that because we believe that we have been entrusted with not only the fullness of truth, but the fullness of grace and the means of grace by which people may indeed find their way uh, to God. So there's a call to preach the good news throughout all of creation, going all the way back to the Gospels. So just a little taste uh, of a church document. I think it's a good um, window into what I was talking about in terms of the openness to recognize that the grace of God is very operative in the whole world in a lot of different ways on a lot of different levels. Uh, and in and through even the hearts and consciences of those who are sincerely trying to do the right thing, who have not yet arrived at that fullness of truth that we, some of us, have been privileged uh, to be immersed in. So, questions? I know some of y'all may be more hesitant to ask questions out loud, and so if you want to write questions down, I think, is there a way for them to do that? Yes, some cards. Our cards are at every table, so if questions come to you and you want to write them down for us to address later, we're happy to do that too. So, all right, now I'd like to go back to document one again, the first one I had up there. And let's scroll down to historical perspective. Thank you very much. I'm not the most technologically savvy person. Or is, you know, what makes us as Catholics distinctive or unique? And I want to answer the question first of all from an historical point of view. So how did it get to be that we are here today, uh, 20 centuries after Jesus of Nazareth, uh, and how are we connected to all of these other Christians throughout the world? And I will say simply that the origins of being Catholic go back to Jesus of Nazareth himself. And actually, in some ways, uh, they even precede that all the way back to the time when God himself uh, claimed a people, Israel, to be his own. That's very interesting. In the Old Testament, God says again and again, you will be my people, 
and I will be your God. So there was a covenant relationship between God and uh, a community of faithful. And in the book of Genesis, God says to Abraham at one point, you will be a father to many nations, and I will be a blessing to you so that you, so that your descendants and all the families of the earth may find blessing in you. So the whole idea of God choosing Israel to be his own people was not somehow that they were a better than the rest of humanity, but God called them or he elected them a people to be a light to the nations in order that God's saving truth might reach out to all the world. So the election or purpose of God in calling a particular people of his own was that they might be God's people for the sake of the world, if you look at it that way. And Isaiah the prophet is the one who really uh, expands that vision of the vocation of Israel to the world. So when Jesus of Nazareth comes on the scene, very interesting. There are some very powerful encounters that he has with people who are not Jewish, not part of God's people. There's one woman in particular, a Canaanite woman, who comes to Jesus, and she asks that Jesus heal her critically ill daughter. Do you know what the first reply of Jesus was? Yeah, I came only for, Jesus said, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, and you almost have this sense that there is a moment of broadening of Jesus' own awareness of mission at that moment. Because at first he says no, and she persists. And she, in the end, she says, you know, even the dogs get to eat the food that falls on the table. And Jesus says, for your great faith, uh, this, this will be granted you. And he said, many in Israel don't have this faith. So he, this encounter is a dramatic turning point in his public ministry that prepares the way for what's going to happen at the resurrection, when Jesus will indeed send them to the whole world. So, but it's interesting, how many disciples does he choose to be in the inner circle, as it were? Those that will be apostles or sent. The number, a very significant number, 12. And why 12, do you think? The 12 tribes of Israel. Jesus, in a prophetic way, is saying by choosing 12, in a real sense, he's reconstituting God's people. He is recreating the 12 tribes of Israel with the 12 apostles. So uh, it's a new beginning, as it were, for God's people that will be sealed in a new covenant in his own death uh, and resurrection on the cross. So this profound uh, beginning uh, flows out of the dying and rising of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So uh, the moment of Pentecost is often talked about as the birthday of the church. So the church is born on Pentecost Sunday. And from there, those disciples in the upper room were given the mission to go out and proclaim the gospel to all the nations. And immediately, Peter goes out, they think he's drunk that morning, and he speaks in a language that everyone from all over the face of the earth and Acts of the Apostles and the nations that they knew about, that they all understood there was a universality to the message. And so the gospel begins to go out to the whole world at that point. So in the beginning, uh, those who were baptized and believed in Jesus considered themselves part of one body throughout the world. And I would say that substantially, in the first thousand years of Christian history, this was seen that way. Were there arguments and tensions in the church? Of course, even in the New Testament. Uh, read Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Paul says, uh, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I'm inclined to believe it. He says, some say uh, they follow Paul, some others follow Apollos or Cephas or one of the other apostles. And then Paul goes on to say, has Christ then been divided? You know, what's wrong with you all? Uh, so the whole idea that somehow we're all part of one body in Christ, and Paul will use that image in his letters. We're part of the body of Christ and every part matters, didn't prevent the fact that there were at times divisions and conflicts and tensions, and even breakaway communities or sects uh, of Christians that broke away in the early church. 
And sometimes they were arguing about very, very intense fundamental issues. I'll give you a good example. One of the hotly contested issues was uh, during the Roman persecutions, they come to your house and they say, will you uh, offer incense to the Roman emperor as God? Well, if you're a follower of Jesus and Jesus is Lord, are you permitted to do that? Never. Uh, that would be one of the greatest sins of the ancient church, you know, that you're supposed to believe that Jesus is Lord, you're not going to worship the Roman emperor as Lord. But now they've shown up at your house and you have a choice. Either you worship the emperor and offer incense, or, you know, it's your time to meet your maker. You know, you will be martyred. Some are martyred and die for their faith at that point. Uh, others, however, uh, said, oh, sure, I'll offer incense to the emperor, and they did. Uh, others uh, had connections in the government, and they were able to get a little certificate saying that they had offered incense, even though they had not. So one of the hotly contested issues in the ancient church was, once the persecution passed, what do you do now with these people who will offer worship to the emperor? Some of the hardline bishops said, tough, they're out of the church. They can't come back. We're not going to receive them back. Uh, it was actually one of the bishops of Rome that was more merciful. And he said, no, and others too. You know, if they're properly repentant, they will go through penance, and we will readmit them to the church. But this was such a conflict in the ancient church, it, there were sects that were created. So it broke Christianity apart in some way, uh, but not in a major way. So that's why I say for the first thousand years, for the most part, you really do have a certain oneness. But uh, you notice a pivotal date is marked there, 1054, the great East-West Schism. Uh, that really is the first time in the history of Christianity when the great church, uh, the Catholic or Orthodox Church, uh, gets broken in half. And why did it happen? Well, there were a lot of reasons that it happened. Uh, there were two different languages in the western and eastern parts of the empire. The eastern part was Greek-speaking, the western part was Latin-speaking. They had a different cultural milieu that developed, uh, different capitals. So once you no longer talk in the same language, you have a different cultural uh, setting, you have different political systems and capitals, uh, it creates uh, a built-in situation where things are easily misunderstood and uh, people don't get along. Uh, anymore. So something about that universality was fundamentally ruptured. So much so that uh, Pope John Paul II, now a saint also, said it's like the church is trying to breathe with one lung instead of two. You need both lungs for the church to function. You need both east and west for the church to be whole again. But apparently uh, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome at the time in 1054, uh, sent representatives to Constantinople where the divine liturgy, what we would call the Mass in the West, was being celebrated. And apparently, they laid the bull of excommunication on the altar during Mass, during the high liturgy, uh, excommunicating the Eastern Church from the West. And that has never been forgotten by the Eastern Churches. So when I just got, someone about three years ago showed me a, a brand new English translation of the Bible written from the Orthodox Church, and they tell the history of the church, and you see right there, in 1054, the papal representatives arrived during the high liturgy and laid the bull of excommunication. It's all printed in, in the introduction to their Bible, you know. It was scandalous for them. So the Eastern uh, patriarchs uh, excommunicated the entire Western Church, so they were not in communion with each other anymore. Uh, this is a very important theological note, one of the fundamental argument points was the Bishop of Rome, the Pope was arguing that he had authority over the whole church and they had to do what he said. The Eastern Patriarch said, no, you have a position of honor and primacy as the abbacy of St. Peter, but you don't have governance authority over us in the East. Uh, we're more ancient than you are. The apostles were in our seats before they got to Rome. So you have this uh, theological tension on what's the role of the Bishop of Rome or the Pope. So um, they tried to heal this rupture in the 1400s at one of the ecumenical councils unsuccessfully. 
Do you know when the excommunications between East and West were finally lifted? Shortly after Vatican II, in the 1960s, Pope Paul VI and now blessed, and the Patriarch of Constantinople mutually lifted the excommunications together. So after a thousand years almost, those double excommunications were lifted. And we as Catholics recognize the Orthodox churches as being fully apostolic, fully sacramental, the Eucharist that they celebrate fully valid, and in fact, for us, there would be no obstacle to a Catholic receiving communion in the Orthodox churches. But we also add that we need to respect the tradition of the East, and the Orthodox are not yet open to us having intercommunion normally. So, uh, so it's an interesting time in history that we're living in. Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict and Pope Francis have all been working to try to heal that rupture of East and West. And back in the late 1990s, you may know that Pope John Paul II wrote a letter and invited non-Catholic theologians to reflect on how we might renew uh, the ministry of Peter, the Bishop of Rome, so that the Pope could be an effective leader for the whole of Christianity. So it's an interesting invitation that he offered back in the late 1900s. But to my knowledge, it's not been, it's not been a huge non-Catholic response yet to that. So we'll see what happens. Uh, the second great division that happened in Christianity in the western part of Christianity occurred in 1517. This is the, uh, the official marking point historically now of what we call the Protestant Reformation. And I can't go into all of the details because I'm trying to do 2,000 years of history in 20 minutes. But um, essentially, uh, Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk who had a very profound sense of his own sinfulness and wrestled with trying to feel that he was accepted by God and justified uh, by God and not condemned for all eternity. And uh, so he is a young man struggling with those core faith issues. In the process of doing that, he made a trip to the city of Rome. At the time, Rome was in the middle of the Renaissance papacy. There was a lot of corruption. Many church leaders were living lavishly and not living the moral dimensions of the gospel. Some of them were married and were not married and mistresses and children. So he was horribly scandalized by what he saw taking place in the leadership in Rome. And they were also raising funds uh, in Rome to build St. Peter's Basilica. And apparently some of the preachers on the ground in the German-speaking areas were using language that seemed to imply that if you spent the money to help build St. Peter's, you could get people out of purgatory and into heaven. So, in Martin Luther's mind, this was people buying people's souls into heaven. And he was horribly offended by this. He was studying Paul's letter to the Romans, and as he was praying with it, he came to this very clear, sudden conviction that we are saved through faith alone, not through any works that we do. And uh, he went to the church at Wittenberg, a famous historical moment. I don't know if it really happened exactly that way, but he nailed his 95 basic theses on the church door of Wittenberg. And uh, when word first got back to Rome, to the Pope, uh, he was apparently out hunting. And um, they said, you know, there's a, a squabble going on in the German church. He said, it's a monk squabble. I'm not getting involved in that at the beginning. But as it became clear that this was growing, uh, Martin Luther in 1521 was excommunicated by the Pope. And uh, at first they really tried to work to heal that split, but something, two significant events that happened. One was more and more of the German princes were becoming politically autonomous, and they didn't want to go along with the big Holy Roman Empire idea any longer. And the other significant development was the, the invention of the printing press. So ideas could be rapidly spread throughout the empire. Throughout, the, throughout Europe, and people could read what Martin Luther and others were saying. Uh, and so that moral, um, um, what do you call it, corruption in the church created the seedbed of this crisis that emerged. So in the end, uh, the unity of Christianity in the West was ruptured. And today we have, I, I don't remember the number, but it's thousands, if not tens of thousands now of Christian denominations and churches in the West that have 
eventually developed out of that great reformation that took place. Uh, the popes were afraid of ecumenical councils at that point. They delayed calling one, but eventually in the mid-1500s, they called the Council of Trent. It went through three long periods of history. There were a number of popes that were popes during that time, which was an attempt to respond to the Protestant Reformation and uh, to reform the Catholic Church and morals so that we would not have the problem of scandal. Um, it's interesting, they even fought uh, in Europe, blood was shed over many years trying to force Protestants to convert and Protestants fighting back against the Catholics. And uh, eventually they agreed to disagree and let everybody remain where they were under the leadership of their own uh, political leaders. Uh, they tried to um, solve the problem with argumentation. But to say that there was a coolness among the Christian denominations for a few centuries thereafter would be sort of an understatement for a long period of time. It's only in the early 20th century that, in the Anglican world and the Protestant world, uh, that the ecumenical movement began to try to bring Christianity back together. And uh, strongly endorsed by the popes of the Second Vatican Council, uh, who were latecomers to the ecumenical movement, but they said, you know, it's time for us to rebuild that lost unity. So I'll say a little bit more about that, uh, but the whole Lutheran movement throughout the world owes that origin to Martin Luther and his fundamental thesis, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Um, at the core of Martin Luther, if I had my whiteboard, I would write a few things on it now. Uh, Martin Luther was convinced that we are saved through faith alone. We can't do anything to earn salvation. Solo fide in Latin. Uh, and he would say, it is by God's grace alone, not by any human effort, that we arrive at salvation. It's a free gift of God. Sola gracia. And how do we know this? We know this through the Word of God, through Scripture alone. So no appeal to church teaching or papal authority or catechisms. Sola scriptura. So we know we're saved through faith and grace alone. We know that through Scripture alone. And John Calvin, uh, who will be a more rigorous uh, reformer, and then even Zwingli, even more so, will so much separate the holiness of God from the evil corruption of humanity in the world that it's either God or creation, God or man. God alone is holy. We're all inherently corrupt and evil. So um, when I talked earlier about Catholics having a fundamental belief that we can experience God anywhere, that is a uniquely Catholic thing, especially when you link it with a more a Protestant or Calvinist suspicion of the world or this created reality. So we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, the other thing that happened was John Smith in 1608 began the Baptist movement. So we had uh, the Baptist movement flowing out of that moment and the Protestant Reformation. And you had more radical reformers, the Anabaptists, who also flowed out in the 1500s, uh, who will become in the United States people like the Mennonites and the Amish, who want to go back to a very um, New Testament way of understanding reality and don't see a connection with um, the tradition that's developed over the last 2,000 years. So one of the elements that you might say is that on the radical reformers' part, they looked back at church history and they felt like we got way out of focus. And they're trying to go back and restore the original pure New Testament church. And even the churches of Christ go back and recreate the original church of the New Testament that's been lost for 2,000 years. And even more extreme, by the way, will be um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. They believe with the death of the last apostle and went to Salt Lake City to the, to the uh, church there and I read all the monuments. At the death of the last apostle, Christianity disappeared from the planet until, um, until it returned uh, in the, I think it was the 1800s. So, um, and that was because of the intervention of what's the founder of Joseph Smith and the tablets that he got. And so the belief that Jesus came to the new world and 
a new book of Mormon that, in a sense, transcends what we call today the New Testament. But it's even a more radical belief that what's taken place over the last 2,000 years, in a sense, doesn't matter. It's to go back and restore the New Testament church in its pristine purity and in the most radical sense of that word. Um, the Church of England, by the way, is a weird exception. Uh, King Henry VIII was what's called a defender of the Catholic faith. Uh, but when he wanted to divorce and remarry and the Pope wouldn't grant an annulment, he decided he was the head of the Church of England and then would go to run away. So he broke from Rome. And after that, the Church of England really struggled with uh, what kind of church it was going to be. There were many who wanted to be very Catholic, but to be under the authority of the king rather than the Pope. And there were many who wanted to be much more Protestant, like Martin Luther or John Calvin. So Anglicanism had to go through its own periods of struggles, and they eventually came out with what they call the middle way, where they sort of agreed to let everybody in the Anglican communion disagree with each other, but had a very broad tent. And you see how that's unfolded in the 20th and 21st centuries in terms of you know, the whole wrestling with, for example, gay uh, bishops or gay marriage um, and women bishops, which the Christian tradition traditionally had not had. They have sort of agreed to let the different parts of the Anglican communion disagree with each other on that. So it's, in that sense, a very broad tent. Um, some in the Anglican communion are more Catholic than the Catholics. And some are more Protestant than the Protestants, so you have a huge variety in that great tradition. So um, that's a little quick snapshot about um, you know how Christianity in that 2,000 year period went from being one, in a sense, one great body, a Catholic or Orthodox communion of Christians throughout the world, to the divisions that we have today. So that's just a quick historical back view. Questions about that? I have a question about the Orthodox um, in the late 90s when they removed the Orthodox Christian one, the next generation. In the 1960s, when we looked at the excommunications, yes. Well, how does that apply to the sacraments? Because my friend converted to Eastern Orthodox, and they won't let me receive communion there, but she can receive. And so I don't understand what, what they did in the 60s. They just agreed to die off? Or? Well, they lifted the formal excommunications of the church East and West. That means that we're not officially in communion with each other. So from a Catholic, Roman Catholic, from a Catholic point of view, we are able to receive communion in the Orthodox churches, and the Orthodox would be able to receive communion in our churches. But the Orthodox are not open to us receiving communion in their churches, nor do they want their members to receive communion in our churches. So we also said let's respect also, even though we would be open to it, let's respect the discipline of the Orthodox Church. Correct. We're not fully healed yet. The excommunications have been lifted, but it's not fully healed yet. Yes. Yeah. This is the Pope's since Paul the Sixth, uh, John the Twenty Third, really have made a real effort to try to heal these divisions. Other questions? Before I talk about the specific things, yes. Far back in the Catholic Church, actually, Christ's history, I mean, obviously, back to Christ, but like the Baptists say that they came from John the Baptist, they don't have any literature from before the 1600s. And, you know, some of the other churches said that we go back to the early Christians, but they can't trace it. You can trace us continuously back, the Orthodox and the Catholic Churches, all the way to the Apostolic Church. So the Apostles uh, went from Jerusalem, and they went throughout the Roman Empire and carried the Gospel. Peter and Paul both went to the city of Rome, where they were only preached the Gospel, but were martyred. 
So all of the Orthodox churches, the churches of the East and Roman Catholic, all have roots going apostolically back to the very beginning. My friend, who became a Roman Catholic priest, grew up Methodist, and uh, he said when they were in a Methodist church, they, you know, the Methodists were much more open. I didn't mention much about the Methodists, but John Wesley emphasized the gospel of love and preached to the coal miners and really reformed Anglicanism to some degree. He didn't attend to start a new church, but that happened. But the Methodists were often in the southern United States, some of the easiest Christians to work with ecumenically, and my friend's uh, Sunday school teacher said, you know, the Catholics really are, our, the Anglicans are our parents, and the Catholics are our grandparents, and the Jewish are great, our great-grandparents. So they saw all the family, they recognized the fam family lineage uh, going down to my So, My own uh, dad's mother was also Methodist. Uh, growing up, and stayed Methodist until almost all the kids were grown and decided she would become Catholic. Uh, as an adult, so she she didn't. They didn't have the OCI in those days. They she she did instructions with the priest locally too. So, all right. So, what makes us as Catholics unique in this greater world of Christianity? Um, that's part three on the outline. And by the way, if you all like this outline that I put this one on the board, I have photocopies up front. You're welcome to pick one up afterwards. I don't know if I have enough for everyone, but if you want when they're available. So uh, I would say, first of all, one of the things that makes us distinctive in the Christian tradition is what I call the sacramental vision of the world. That we have this, we, have, we wear sacramental glasses, that we see the hand of God at work in all of creation. And that's why, by the way, we're so comfortable bringing created things into our worship. It's the way that we express our faith in and believe in worship of God and the way that we believe God comes to us. We are very uh, into the senses. That's why when you go into many Catholic churches, it's not just word, it's you're surrounded by things that touch the senses. Stained glass, uh, statues, icons, uh, blessed water, incense, candles, uh, vestments. Um, when you go into the medieval cathedrals, it's like walking into a, another universe. Uh, so, you know, we have this fundamental trust that God works in and through created stuff. And it's so fundamental, we'll talk about it later with sacraments, but all the sacraments include elements of creation, bread, wine, water, oil, human hands and touch. So uh, we are a sacramental people. Uh, I realized this as a little boy. I went to the Catholic Church in Lawrenceburg, and when we walked into that German Gothic church, it had, had high altars with statues, the smell of incense and candles that had burned there for over a century, um, the stained glass windows. I went to a friend's church for a wedding, uh, and I walked in, and it was black walls, a podium up front, and I think that was the Church of Christ. They didn't use any instruments in music. So the simplicity and the starkness of it compared to our sacramental sacramentalness uh, is immediately evident in the way that we go about things. And that's why even you know, we have these things, rosaries, we're touching, we're making motions on our bodies, and bowing and genuflecting and kissing books and tables. And you know we're very corporeal and body in our approach to faith. It's part of the sacramental vision. The second great thing about being Catholic, I mentioned it last week, is we are both and people. So what was our answer, by the way, to Martin Luther's great challenge? We're saved, Martin Luther said, through our faith alone. The response at the end that we get was no. We are saved through faith, but that faith is always expressed in our lives, through our works. So faith and works together. Uh, the grace of God, yes, we can't be saved without God's grace, but human cooperation, grace and human cooperation with that grace and freedom work together. Uh, yes, God reveals himself in scripture, but not scripture alone, through scripture and tradition, a faith that's been handed down to us through the centuries. And to uh, Calvin, we would say, 
God and the world. Yes, God is creator distinct from the world, but there is also a, a fundamental relationship between God and humanity, God and the world. So that a great both and rather than the Protestant uh, either or approach. Now I will add as a quick aside, by the way, that these things that I'm talking about that make us uniquely Catholic are also very much shared by the Orthodox. They too are very sacramental, they're very both and in their approach to things. Um, but we also have a sense of tradition that we're always aware that we are part of this great unfolding of how the faith has been lived for 2,000 years. So we are connected to not only people throughout the whole planet today who are Catholic, in every language of the world, every country of the world, we are a universal church, but we are connected with people of faith for this great 2,000 year tradition. So we claim everybody. We claim uh, Cyprian and the East and John Chrysostom. We claim Augustine. We claim those who had conflicts with each other uh, in the history of the church. Um, we claim all of it as belonging to that great Catholic communion. So we are very aware that we are a part of this great tradition. Um, if you're in the Church of Christ, in the 1800s and early 1900s, you could think, we rediscovered Christianity, it's been gone for 2,000 years. But from a Catholic point of view, we've known this mystery for all of these years. Do we always live it well? No. Have we distorted it? Yes. Uh, have we gotten off track from what we're supposed to be? Obviously, at times. And even recently, you can certainly find uh, evidence of that in recent history. So I always say, by the way, to those who are thinking about becoming Catholic, um, you're not becoming Catholic because we're all perfect. Be, be very aware of that. Uh, we have the same flaws that the rest of humanity has. We have all the same wrinkles. Uh, so and the difference is not that we are perfect. We are not. Uh, it's that we are these perfect vessels that are carrying this treasure that is untold value, which is Christ the Lord. So to the extent that we don't live according to that, call, uh, we we besmirch the name of Christian. You know, Gandhi, one of the greatest spiritual leaders of the 20th century, never became a Christian, although he greatly admired Jesus. And someone asked him one day, why, why didn't you become a Christian? And he said, I've never actually seen one, or I would be one. So he was so he admired the teachings of Jesus, but he never saw anybody actually living fully that gospel that Jesus proclaimed. So, um, but that sense of being part of this great tradition and this universal community. And one of course, one of the very uniquely Catholic things is we are the only uh, Christian church in the whole world that believes that indeed, that we have an earthly figure, the Bishop of Rome, who has this authority to shepherd over the entire church throughout the world. Now, how that gets understood, um, the unfolding, we could study papal history quite a lot. In the medieval period, the papacy took on a lot of the trappings of monarchs of Europe, and they took on the trappings of power and privilege. And perhaps John Paul was right in saying, we need a way of redefining the, the ministry of the Bishop of Rome so that we can, so that he can indeed be an effective shepherd for uh, all of Christianity. So that may happen someday. When Knows. Uh, I suspect that the only way it will happen is a combination of a deeper awareness of what connected us together in the very beginning with a figure of great humility like Pope Francis, uh, who clearly makes it clear that it's not about him as a person, but it's the world to which he has been called. It's interesting, I don't know if you paid attention, when he was elected Bishop of Rome, you know what he said? He said, you all went to the end of, ends of the earth to find a bishop for Rome. He didn't say a pope. He is the pope, of course, the bishop of Rome is the pope. But he emphasized the bishop of Rome, which is one of the most ancient titles, the successor of St. Peter, the bishop of Rome. And in his role as bishop of Rome, is he the shepherd of the universal church, following in the footsteps of Peter. But in the ancient church, they would all say, always say, the see of Peter and Paul the two great apostles who bear witness by their, their faith and their death in the city of Rome. All 
All right, so that's a little bit of an introduction to Catholicism by way of a big bird's eye view uh, questions or observations. So in the weeks and months ahead, we will be unfolding various elements uh, and looking at them more profoundly and deeply. So this is just a quick overview. So um, you all have a wonderful rest of the evening. Janet, you're going to close us with.